Welcome back this morning to the uh, uh, this lecture by uh, Reverend Dr. Gordon Jensen, our uh, Bordern Chair in Theology and also uh, the uh, Professor of Reformation uh, Theology and History. I have the, uh, the distinct pleasure and the high honor, as they say, of introducing to you uh, Gordon. Gordon has been on the faculty now for 10 years. He has served as the dean for a good portion of that time. Uh, we've given him the year off so that he could work on some other projects. He came out of his sabbatical um, two years ago now with uh, research into uh, dialogues, ecumenical dialogues in the 16th century that might have some bearing on our ecumenical dialogues today. Uh, sometimes we have to go back to the future, uh, as the movie put it. Uh, Gordon and I uh, were both at a meeting in Chicago on Monday. Uh, I took the red eye and came home early, and he came uh, back uh, yesterday, partly because there's some other conversations happening with partner seminaries in North America that that he's been a part of and has been instrumental in helping to make happen. Uh, you may, might wonder how seminaries uh, in North America relate to each other, and there are meetings, uh, especially of the deans of all the uh, ELCA schools and the two Canadian schools. Uh, and that has been very fruitful and productive, and Gordon has been instrumental in making that happen. So because he's good at drawing people together, let's hear how um, his research has, of people being drawn together uh, might inform our own uh, period of time. Without further ado, the Reverend Dr. Gordon Jensen. speak about this morning comes out of my uh, sabbatical. Uh, I have been working on a uh, what's uh, known as the Wittenberg Concord, which was uh, signed in May of 1536 between uh, the Wittenberg theologians and the uh, South Germans uh, uh, theologians led by uh, Martin Bootser, the other Martin. And uh, it was, uh, I would say, the first real ecumenical agreement uh, after the uh, schisms of the Reformation. It was the first time that uh, groups came together and agreed on some issues. And uh, we do have that document, so I've been working on that. And when I was in uh, Wittenberg on sabbatical, I, uh, a good place to research the Wittenberg Concord, I was in the uh, Luther House Library one day, and uh, the librarian came over to me and says, uh, oh, you're working on this. I'm wondering if you'd be interested in looking at this document. And she uh, handed me a handwritten paper. Uh, it was actually a copy of Luther's handwritten paper. It was copied by uh, Justice Jonas, his uh, friend. And it had the seven, seven points of instruction that Luther had written out for Philip Melanchthon uh, when he went to, to have preliminary negotiations with Martin Bootser. So I got to uh, handle this uh, handwritten piece of paper uh, with the notes. Um, and, uh, terribly small writing, so it took a while to uh, figure it out. And, uh, and uh, first of all, it was uh, uh, in uh, Latin, so you had to, and, and abbreviated Latin, so the first step is always to translate all the abbreviated words into uh, what the words were before you could even figure out what it was. But uh, I found a treasure uh, uh, in that. And uh, at the same time, I had been uh, following uh, some of Bootser's writing and came across a document that he presented and was approved by the uh, people in uh, the theologians in Constance when they were meeting. And I, to my surprise, it was on the same day. These two, uh, the day the instructions were written and the day they approved the uh, uh, 10 points in Constance. And uh, I uh, do believe after I was doing further research, and this will be one of my chapters, is that uh, it was the uh, writings on this day that actually made the agreement in uh, the negotiations in Castle, Germany, uh, 12, 15 days later, and the Wittenberg Concord possible. So uh, that's why I think this is important, and it dealt with the two points that I 
put in the title, who eats what? <laughs> and that was the big debate. Now, I thought for a while, this is a kind of arcane and uh, who, who really cares and why does it really matter? But when you think of it, since the Reformation, I would say the two major obstacles to uh, agreements ecumenically keep coming down to two matters, the Lord's Supper and the orders of ministry. And it was one of the biggest issues amongst the Protestants in the Reformation, and which probably uh, hindered them uh, more than anything. So that's uh, what I want to look at. Some said actually the Lord's Supper is the Achilles heel of the Reformation movement. The Roman Church, of course, delighted in all the infighting amongst the uh, reforming groups on this issue, and, but it also was a stumbling block to the Schmalkald League political alliance that the leaders so desperately needed. Again and again, when the leaders wanted to strike a political agreement and to form an alliance, it always came down to the political leaders saying, but what is our common theology? And what they always got hung up on was the Lord's Supper. Thus, you had the uh, aborted attempts at um, Marburg, uh, called by Philip of Hesse in uh, the fall of uh, 1529, where ironically they could agree to, uh, as most say, 14 and three quarter points out of 15, but couldn't agree on this issue. Uh, and it wasn't enough. And it meant then that when it came time for the Diet of Oxford a year later, that instead of one unified Protestant presentation to the emperor, they had the Augsburg Confession, they had uh, other confessions, the Tetrapolitan, for example, by Bootser and others, because they could not agree on the Lord's Supper. And it's probably also why the 10th article in the Augsburg Confession is only, uh, is, is about the shortest of any of the articles, because Frankly, they couldn't say any more than what was there. <laughs> to say any more would have caused further splitting. So they had to leave it short and sweet. The political leaders also didn't make it easier by uh, originally, after the Diet of Augsburg, insisting or wanting uh, all the political rulers <coughs> and theologians to agree to the Augsburg Confession. And uh, that was uh, uh, when they formed the Schmalkall League in 1531. It was uh, strongly encouraged, shall I say, that they all subscribed to the Augsburg Confession. That wasn't strong enough for some. And finally, in December of 1535, so a year after this, it was made a requirement. You had to subscribe to the Augsburg Confession. Now, why did they do that? Well, there was more politics behind this. In um, the beginnings of 1534, at this uh, time before it, remember they were calling, uh, considering a council of the church, and uh, the Pope had sent around a, a, a legate, an ambassador, to find out the mood, to see whether it would actually go. He makes a visit to, to Wittenberg and other places. But in uh, 1535, after this document, um, they were really courting Henry VIII to join the Schmalkall League and the new reform movement because in 1534, the same year as this, uh, uh, Henry VIII and the Parliament enacted the uh, Acts of Reform, which really started the, the church in England as an independent church and on a road to a moderate way of reformation. But what's less known is at the same time, the Pope sent a uh, legate to France to meet with a delegate of uh, elector of Saxony to discuss whether the Pope could also join the Schmalkall League, this <laughs> Protestant military alliance. <laughs> <laughs> At first, when I translated it from the Latin, I thought I must have made a mistake and, or maybe they had miscopied it, but I discovered that that was actually the case because the uh, Pope's greatest political enemy was Charles V. And what better way to, uh, to uh, align Francis <coughs> I, the Pope's political supporter, with Henry VIII and the German Protestant princes against Charles V. 
I often wish it would have happened. <laughs> but it's uh, one of those, the truth is stranger than fiction in these cases. <clears throat> Martin Bootser is often uh, treated in this whole thing as uh, uh, with a lot of disdain because they felt he was always flipping his opinion in order to get agreement. That was the common uh, uh, consensus amongst many, that he would change his theology depending on who he was talking to. That wasn't the case. Uh, he did change his mind from his earliest writings where he was strongly influenced by uh, Zwingli in uh, Zurich. But after that, he started to change his uh, opinion and was convinced more and more by what Luther uh, was writing, especially in the sacramental debates uh, that took place in 1525, 26, 27, and 28, which culminated with Luther's great uh, treatise, which is, he often called his great confession concerning the Lord's Supper. So that was the uh, culmination of that. But from that point on, uh, Bootser became much more consistent in his theology. He was trying to get an agreement with Philip Melanchthon and Luther leading up to the Diet of Augsburg. It didn't work. And uh, with the debates afterwards, finally Martin Bootser went to Coburg Castle, where Luther had been staying during the uh, Diet, and uh, visited him, and had some very, very frank conversations, which started a good uh, friendship. Uh, again and again, you'll note that uh, Luther says, I can agree with him in my heart, but in my head I'm not so sure yet. <laughs> it sounded right to his heart, but uh, often he said, what are the implications? So uh, with that, uh, conversations began between Luther, Melanchthon, and uh, Bootser. Now Bootser had also <clears throat> first encountered Luther in 1518 when uh, he was a uh, Dominican monk in Heidelberg. And he happened to take in Luther's uh, lecture when he presented the Heidelberg Disputation, which really started, Melanch or which started Bootser along the road uh, to Reformation himself. Uh, he uh, writes about how instrumental that Heidelberg Disputation was in his uh, formation. Bootser also does something else, and that's he insists on the phrase uh, cum pane, with the bread. That word with becomes central for Bootser. Luther is some would say all over the map because he says he, it's uh, Christ he is uh, with the bread or in the bread and other places we talk as Lutherans about in, with, and under the bread. And uh, Bootser would look at that and say, you need to be more precise. What is it? Is it in, is it with, or is it under? Because to Bootser, each one of those made, uh, meant something very, very different significantly different. So, when uh, Bootser argues with the bread, or first with Luther, what Luther was really saying is all these prepositions really don't matter a whole lot. What they're trying to do is describe a reality. That all of these prepositions were trying to explain, in his mind, the real presence of Christ. In this, as you are holding this bread in your hand, you are holding Christ's real presence. And as you eat it, you are eating Christ's real presence for your salvation. It is an actual reality, and that is actually, in Luther's mind, exactly what makes it a sacrament. Truly a gift. Christ's presence. Another way to approach this is what Luther was really arguing is that in the sacrament of the altar, the Lord's Supper teaches us and is a reflection of the incarnational presence of Christ. And that emphasis on the incarnation becomes absolutely crucial for Luther. And so he has no trouble talking about how Christ is in the bread, along with the bread and under the sign of the bread, because it was all pointing to Christ being truly and really present. And that's why Luther was so happy in the uh, uh, agreements from, uh, or the Constance Articles of 1534, because the South Germans had finally admitted uh, 
that they recognized that Christ was really, truly present. That was the major obstacle in Luther's mind to an agreement. And when they finally say it in the Constance Articles, Luther felt that there was a breakthrough. So by uh, those using the same words, interpreting them different, Luther on the one hand and Luther on the other, they actually reached an agreement. That was actually the model, by the way, for the joint declaration on the doctrine of justification that was signed uh, with the Roman Catholics in 1999. Uh, it's actually, I think, is modeled on the uh, Wittenberg Concord in many uh, respects. Because in the joint declaration, they say we together agree, in the, in the first paragraph on uh, in each of seven points, we together agree on this. And then the next two paragraphs would always be, and when the Lutherans say this, they mean this. And the Catholics say, and when we say this, we mean this on the other hand. And yet, the words in the phrase and in the agreement uh, stay together. That is what uh, allowed the Wittenberg Concord to survive uh, as long as it did, and with the strengths that it did. Um, it led to some great changes, and in fact, uh, Bootser, who uh, was the pastor and theologian in uh, Strasbourg, um, he later goes to England, but uh, uh, Strasbourg becomes a Lutheran city uh, after, uh, in, the, in the 1550s, 1558, I believe, after he had died. Uh, they actually become Lutheran uh, because of this agreement. And it, uh, uh, short, uh, to some degree, strengthened the Schmalkald League politically, although uh, Henry VIII and the Pope did not join it. But then uh, because of the uh, issues of bigamy of Philip of Hesse mm -hmm. and um, uh, uh, Duke Moritz, who was the elector of Saxony's uh, cousin, the one who wanted the throne, agreed to uh, hand him over to the elector so that, uh, because the elector promised him the right of electing the new emperor, uh, those, that traitor, uh, traitorous act, uh, they removed the two best military uh, tacticians from the Schmalkall League. And when uh, Rome then launched its attack, uh, military attack, in the war of Schmalkall in 1547, uh, uh, it was a short battle and uh, uh, the end of the Schmalkall League. But until then, it was probably the stronger force. So sometimes these little words do make a difference. Sometimes uh, we will just uh, butt our heads and trying to uh, uh, insist that people mean the same thing with each word as we do. Sometimes, like this agreement in the Wittenberg Concord and other agreements, we perhaps have to settle on the idea that maybe it says more than both of us mean. And that's exactly what we need to do in an ecumenical conversation. I'll just finish by saying uh, I'm, this is on my mind because uh, I have been appointed by uh, uh, our bishop, the national bishop, and the uh, uh, primate of the Anglican Church to be on the Anglican team as they begin uh, ecumenical dialogues with the United Church of Canada starting next week. And would you believe it, the first issue on the docket is the Lord's Supper. <laughs> and this is going to be one of the crucial issues. So it does matter. Uh, it, it, it is an issue for debate on who eats the Lord's Supper and what is eaten.